Going? Yeah. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning, morning. all you empty chairs out there. And if you're watching on Facebook and you should be at church, shame on you. <laughs> we're back on Facebook because we couldn't get the other one to work. So if you enjoy watching the services on Facebook, hey, we're glad to have you. We're going to start off with, are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Before we get going, though, uh, Tina, would you like to read our scripture and pray when we're done? Uh, sure. Uh, sure. All right. Are you washed in the blood? You're going to find the words right up there on the screen. Are you washed in the blood of the land? Are you fully trusting in the grace this hour? Are you washed in the blood of the land? Are you washed? Are you washed in the blood of the land? In the blood of the land? Are you washed? Are you washed? Are you washed in the blood of the land? Walking day by the Savior's side, are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Who grants each moment in the crucified? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? In the holy blood of the Lamb, are your garments spotless? Are they white? The bridegroom comes to robe me in white. Are you washed in the blood of the land? Will your soul be ready for the mansion of Are you washed in the blood of the land? Are you washed in the blood in the soul in the blood of the land? Are your garments washed? Are they white? Be washed in the blood of the Lamb. There's a fountain flowing for the soul of the Lamb. Holy blood in the blood of the Lamb. Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? In the soul of the blood of the Lamb. Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Our scripture comes out of 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 17 through 20. But as God hath distributed to every man, as the Lord hath called everyone, so let him walk. <coughs> and so ordain I in all the churches. Is any man called being circumcised? Let him not be uncircumcised. Is any man called in uncircumcision? Let him not be circumcised. Circumcision is nothing, and uncircumcision is nothing, but the keeping of the commandments of God. Let every man abide in the calling wherein he was called. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you for being able to come to your house this morning to worship you. We just ask that our worship of you be pleasing to you. Be with Chris as he's bringing the message. Open our ears and our hearts to receive that message, Lord. Just be with us as we're going through this service. We just ask these things in your son's precious and holy name. Amen. 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 Thank you, Tina. All right, prayer praises. Anybody got any prayer praises? Well, thank God we got some rain yesterday, right? We certainly could have used the rain and we got it, and it was a blessing. My chickens weren't too happy. You ever heard that expression, matter in the wet hand? Well, they were all wet. So they were all mad. They were making a lot of noise yesterday. And I didn't give them like two eggs, so they're really mad. But uh, thank God we got the rain, right? Although I was supposed to change the oil in Tina's car yesterday, but I didn't feel like getting wet, so I got to do it today. But it only takes like 15 minutes. Anybody got any prayer praises at all? Thank God for everybody being here this morning. Right? And if you're watching on uh, Facebook, we're glad to have you. Uh, we were going to... Hey, Facebook works, and uh, we couldn't get it to work on Mayway, so we, we just fired up the page again, and 
it is what it is. We'd like we'd like for people to be able to join us through Facebook uh, and and be blessed from the services. So that's why we're back there, and we have that. So thank God for that. Amen. Amen. All right. Now this time of prayer praises is for everyone to lift up their praises to the Lord, not just the preacher to talk. So. I have my doctor's appointment tomorrow to find out all of my test results. Tina's going to get all her test results. We hope she passes. Yep. Right? Mm -hmm. I'm so dumb I won't spell the blood test. <laughs> and age test, I only missed one question. All right. Well, let's see here. Announcements. We don't really have any much to announce coming on this week, uh, except, you know, our regular church uh, times are... Uh, Sunday mornings, Sunday school is at 9.45. Uh, morning worship is at 11 o'clock. And on Wednesday night at 7 o'clock, we do have prayer meeting and Bible study. And this last Wednesday, we celebrated birthdays, so we had cupcakes. So if you missed out, you missed out on cupcakes. Bill had more than his share. <laughs> yeah, I did. So anyway, uh, Wednesday night, prayer meeting. And then uh, we will, have, men of God will probably be, when the weather turns nicer, a little warmer, we'll probably start having men of God again. And also, we're looking to uh, build a children's department, and we'd like to have BBS this summer. So, if you'd like to be involved in that, and you're a part of the church, uh, you could come and volunteer, and we can start putting that together now. And we'd like to be able to do something with a youth group and build a youth group. Uh, so, be in prayer about that. Um, let's see. Other announcements are that if you're visiting with us, there are visitor cards in the back. And we'd love for you to fill those out and put them in the offering. We do not pass the plate. There's just a box nailed to the wall in the back. And if you feel like putting some in there, feel free. But if you don't have anything, you don't feel like you're able to contribute, don't let it bother you. That's the reason we don't pass the plate. We don't want it to bother you. We want you to come and worship the Lord and not feel like you have to pay or give an offering or anything like that because that's not what we're about. We're about, you know, worshiping the Lord Jesus and just allowing people uh, to come in unfettered by the things of the world and to just take their troubles and leave them outside the door and come in here and just rest in the presence of Jesus. But if you fill out a, a uh, visitor form and put it in the back, you will get our newsletter in the mail, which uh, I didn't realize, but today is the last Sunday in January. So it looks like I'll be working on the newsletter all day tomorrow. <laughs> but um, you'll get a newsletter in the mail that's free of charge. Of course, it's just another way we like to bless people and keep people informed of what's happening in the church. So, uh, those are the only announcements that I have. Uh, and anybody have anything they'd like to add? Anything else? Don't be shy. All right, then. So, I read a report, a new report came out about how our government works in this day and age. Understanding our government. Our government today will invest $60,000 to buy a school bus so that they can deliver kids from their front door to the front door of the school and then back again. And then they'll go out so they won't have to walk too much, you see. They're worried about kids having to walk great distances to school. So they'll invest $60,000 to buy a school bus to deliver them from home to school and back again. But then they go out and spend $5 million on building a gymnasium so the very same kids can get some exercise. All right, well, I thought that was clever or funny, but uh, anybody have anything to add before we move on to worship? Uh, you have somebody asking what the scripture is going to be. The scripture is going to be uh, the book of uh, Hosea. That's right after the book of um, Joel, Daniel, Joel, Hosea. And it's going to be chapter 1, Hosea chapter 1. So you can go ahead and look there. We're going to talk about family today. But before that, we're going to sing, all right? So we're going to start with one called, No One Cares For Me Like Jesus. The words are up on the screen. Let me hear you sing out this morning. I would love to tell you what I think about Jesus. Since I found a friend in him so worthy and true. I would tell you how he changed my life completely. He did something no other friend could do. No one ever cared for me like Jesus. There is no other friend faithful and true. No one else could take away my sin. Jesus will do all my 
life was full of sin when Jesus found me. All my heart was full of misery and woe. Jesus placed his loving God around me. To go. No one ever cared for me like Jesus. There is no other friend faithful and true. No one else could take away my sin and sorrow.
preaching on the front row. Watch it. Am I out of place? Or? I think you feel more comfortable. You're going to be in the back seat. <laughs> <laughs> All the way back. One there. Back seat Baptist. Come every soul to sin and press. There's mercy with the Lord, and He will surely give you rest by trusting in His word. Oh, only trust Him, only trust Him, only trust Him now. He will save. Someone clap, so. Well, that's right. I'd really hear an amen. Amen. That's it. You're watching on Facebook and suddenly the, the camera looked like we had an earthquake. That wasn't an earthquake. That was Hurricane Thomas. Tony. Tony, excuse me. Sorry. Hurricane Tony. Hurricane Tony coming back from the restroom. <laughs> climbing through the air. <laughs> he's not laughing. I guess he doesn't think he's funny. We're just having a little fun at your expense there, Tony. <laughs> All right, take your Bible and find the book of Hosea. Hosea, H O S E A. I don't know if you pronounce it Hosea or Hosea. Or the word called Hosea. Hosea chapter 1. We're going to. Well, it's Hebrew. No, I'm in Southern Baptist, so it's Jose. No, Jose. Josie. Anyway, um. O.C. chapter 1, verses 1 through 9, and then we're going to look at chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. Can you find that? If you wouldn't mind standing with me to honor God and His Word this morning. O.C. chapter 1, beginning in verse 1, and it says, The word of the Lord that came unto O.C., the son of Beeri, in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah, and in the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel. The beginning of the word of the Lord by Hose, and the Lord said unto Ho and the Lord said to Hose, Take unto thee a wife of whoredoms and children of whoredoms, for the land hath committed great whoredom departing from the Lord. So he went and took Gomer, the daughter of Diblaim, which conceived and bare him a son. 
And the Lord said unto him, Call his name Jezreel. For yet a little while, and I will avenge the blood of Jezreel upon the house of Jehu, and will cause to cease the kingdom of the house of Israel. And it shall come to pass at that day that I will break the bow of Israel in the valley of Jezreel. And she conceived again and bare a daughter, and God said unto her, Call her name lo ru Hamath, for I will no more have, have mercy upon the house of Israel, but I will utterly take them away. But I will have mercy upon the house of Judah, and will save them by the Lord their God, and will not save them by bow, nor by sword, nor by battle, by horses, nor by horsemen. Now when she had weaned lo ru Hamath, she conceived and bare a son. Then said God, Call his name lo Ami, for you are not my people, and I will not be your God. And if you go over to chapter 3, verses 1 through 3 says, Then said the Lord unto me, Go yet love a woman, beloved of her friend, yet an adulteress, according to the love of the Lord, toward the children of Israel, who looked to other gods and loved flagons of wine. So I bought her to me for fifteen pieces of silver, and for a homer of barley, and a half homer of barley. And I said unto her, Thou shalt abide for me many days. Thou shalt not play the harlot, and thou shalt not be for another man, so will I also be for thee. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, thank you for the testimony of your word and the, uh, the life that Hosea lived, and through that which we may learn and be edified and grow to love you and trust in you and to walk according to your word. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. I want to point out before I get too far into it that the names of Hosea's children are very, uh, they are consequential to what's happening here. First of all, his... Um, First son, Jezreel, means that I will avenge the blood. I will avenge the blood. And then his, his daughter's name, lo Ruma means I will have no mercy, right? Let's see, six. Uh, no mercy. Her name means no mercy. And then the third one, uh, lo Ami means not my people. And so, uh, Hosea's family figured prominently into his ministry. Bear that in mind as we get into this message. Now, every all men and women are born with a free will. That means the individual has the final word in how he or she is going to live their life. That means the individual has the final word in the decisions that he or she makes. Now we have the final decision in the character that we choose to live by and the character we choose to display. And we also have the final word in how we're going to relate to one another, as in relationships. By this, I mean to express very clearly, that our free will, our free and determined will, is involved in whom we choose to love or not to love. Our free will is involved in our relationships. Now, I know that there are many people, and they believe you don't choose who you love. And they'll say it like this, well, the heart wants what the heart, the heart wants what the heart wants, and I hate that expression. I do. Just, you know, just an aside, I hate it when someone says, well, you know, the heart wants what the heart work wants because, you know what, that's nothing more than an excuse to abandon a commitment and a promise that you've made. If your heart doesn't want what it wants, you control what you want or what you don't want. Amen. And love is a choice that we make. Love is a choice that we make. We can choose the people in our lives that we're going to love, and we can also choose the people in our lives that we don't love. We can choose who we're going to care for and who we don't care for. And keeping our commitments to those whom we choose to love, well, that's another thing altogether, isn't it? Because, listen, choosing to love someone and to continue in a relationship with them, it's not always easy, is it? We don't make it easy on one another to love each other, do we? Keeping the commitments we make to each other, that is one of life's great difficulties. That's why the divorce rate in our country is what it is, because keeping our commitments and choosing to love one another no matter what, it is tough. It's hard. See, I'm speaking to you as a man who's struggled you know, with loving people and living in relationship with other people and choosing to continue to love people even when it's difficult to do so. Loving the people in our lives our wives, our husbands, our spouses, our children, loving our extended family, uh, loving our church family, it can be difficult. And you know why it's difficult? Because we're all broken and sinful people, and we're all flawed in some way, are we not? Everybody has character flaws. Whether or not they choose to display them, that's another thing. 
But everybody has character flaws. Everybody has idiosyncrasies. Everybody has deficiencies, which makes living in relationship with one another difficult at times. And there are times, there are times where we are not, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> there are times when we are not <coughs> at our best, like right now, when I swallowed wrong and now I can't talk. <coughs> There are times when we're not at our best. There are times when we act selfish. There are times when we're self-centered. Thank you so much, dear young man. Don't kick the, 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 the camera on the way back. Yes, sir. <laughs> Still not laughing, Tony. You missed. Oh, that is the spot. Thank you. There are times that we're not at our best. There are times when we act selfish. There are times when we can be self-centered. There are times when we're inconsiderate. You know, uh, just to put it plainly, there are times in life where each and every one of us can be a real jerk. Amen, preacher. You said it right there. Amen. Sometimes you just got to pat yourself on the back and give yourself an amen for speaking the truth. And all that means is that there are times that every one of us can be a person who's not easy to love. Every one of us can be a person who's not easy to love. I thought my wife would amen that, but she's being curiously silent. But does that mean that we should stop being loving? Does that mean that we should not love our others? Certainly not. The Lord Jesus said this, John 15, 12. This is my commandment, that ye love one another as I have loved you. And then he reiterates this in John 15, 17. These things I command you, that ye love one another. Now, if those two verses were not enough, we also have this in John 13, 34, and 35. A new commandment I give unto you that ye love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. Now listen to what Jesus says. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if you have love one to another. So the Christian, the Christian, the true believer in Christ is identified by what? By being a loving person. By choosing to love people and to continue in relationships with people even when it's difficult to do so. And the question, the question that is put to us by Scripture, by what we're reading here, by the Lord Jesus commands is, you know, can you truly love an unfaithful and unloving person? Can you love someone who's not faithful, not true, and unloving? Can a Christian respond in love to men and women who do not reflect any good or godly character whatsoever? How should Christians react and, and how should Christians react, respond to unfaithful and unloving people? Because the plain truth of the matter is, is that we encounter unfaithful and unloving people every day. And we're going to continue to encounter unfaithful and unloving people. And it's going to get worse as the end of the age is approaching. And, and we see that in our own day and age. Matthew chapter 24, verses 9 through 12. The Lord Jesus said, Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted, and they shall kill you, and you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended, and shall betray one another. And many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. Listen to what he says. He finishes this by saying, And because iniquity shall abound, and because sinfulness shall abound, the love of many shall grow cold. Clearly, clearly, when you, when you look around, when you look at the culture that we're living in this day and age, clearly you can see that we're living in a loveless age. And yet according to our relationship with the Lord Jesus by faith, and according to the commandment of our Lord and Savior, we must love these unlovable people. Now that's why we're looking at the story of Hosea. Hosea the prophet. This is a man of God. Preacher of the gospel. Preacher of God's word. Prophet of God. And yet the Lord instructs him, commands him to do what? To marry an un faithful woman. This is a man of God who was married to an unfaithful woman. This is a man of God who was married to a woman who was so unfaithful, who was uh, so disregarded the Lord Jesus, disregarded God, that she sold herself into prostitution. Now you can only imagine what type of household that was to live in. But God 
commanded this man to love this uncommitting, uncommitted, unfaithful, unloving woman. Look again at verse 2. The beginning of the word of the Lord by Hosea. And the Lord said to Hosea, Go take up, go take unto thee a wife of whoredoms. That is an unfaithful woman. For the land hath committed great whoredom, departing from the Lord. So Hosea is a man of God who has to contend with a wife who from all the evidence in the Bible, she didn't practice any faith whatsoever, not in God. She didn't practice any, practice any faithfulness whatsoever, not in, in the Lord. She wasn't faithful to her husband. And, and the Lord says the reason why that God commanded Hosea to marry this woman is because this woman is a picture of his relationship to unfaithful Israel. And so the question, the question comes to my mind is can a believer truly love an unfaithful person? That is, a person who's unfaithful in their relationship and unfaithful to the Lord Jesus Christ and, and unfaithful in everything else. Untrustworthy in every way. Can a believer truly love an unfaithful, untrustworthy, adulterous person? So I want to get the preliminary questions out of the way first. I'm talking about marriage and relationships. Can a, can a believer, can a believer in Jesus Christ be married to an unbeliever? And the answer, of course, is yes. It happens all the time. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 12 through 14 says this, But to the rest I speak, to the rest speak I, not the Lord. If any brother hath a wife that believes not, and she be pleased to dwell with him, let him not put her away. And the woman which hath an husband that believe not, and if he be pleased to dwell with her, let her not leave him. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Else were your children unclean, but now they are holy. Now, this doesn't mean that an unbeliever is somehow saved by being married to a believer. And I, I mean, I've heard people preach this. Well, if you're a believer and your spouse is not, by the fact that you're a believer, they're saved too. They're included too. Nope, that is not correct. The only way to be saved is to have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. God only has children. He doesn't have any grandchildren. There's no being saved by proxy of another person's relationship to the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. But what this means is, listen, what this means is that an unbelieving spouse will receive blessings by the fact that he or she is married to a child of God. That's what it means. That person will be blessed because they're married to a believer. Unbelievers receive blessing through living in close proximity to believers. And the blessings they receive are all residual in nature. Now, as a child of God, you should understand this. This is exactly what the Syrophoenician woman come to understand or presented to the Lord when she was petitioning him for the sake and welfare of her daughter. The Lord Jesus said, it's not right to take the children's food and feed it to the dogs. And she said, yes, but even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the table. That's the understanding of things. The entire world is blessed because of the believers that reside in it and for no other reason. They get the residual blessings. And so an unbeliever married to a believer is going to find their life blessed, but it isn't because of anything about them. It's because of who they're married to. In addition to this, when Paul says, else were your children unclean, but now they are holy, he's speaking to these children having the benefit of a two-parent household, and having the benefit of at least one of those parents believing in the Lord Jesus Christ. But the point that I want to make is that there are situations in which a believer may find himself or herself married to an unbeliever. But that's not permission from God to go out and marry an unbeliever. Okay? That's not permission to marry an unbeliever. You can marry whomever you please. As long as they will have you. Let me put that out there. Because some of you are like, I'm gonna, I got this person in mind, and they don't want nothing to do with you. Right? You can marry whomever you please. And as a matter of fact, you know, I'm not really worried about who you're married to. I, I once drove a truck with a guy. He's a white guy, and he's married to a, a black lady. And he had a picture of his wife on the, uh, on the, deck, on the top, the shelf up there. On a, uh, if you ever drove an 18 wheeler, there's a shelf up there. And he had her picture there, and I just saw the picture of the person, and I just casually said, hey, is this your wife? And he says, yeah, I did. You got a problem with that? <laughs> no, I don't have a problem with it. I was just curious if it was his wife or not, or maybe some other driver left it in there. 
right? You know, and, and then I told him, I said, I don't care who you're married to, black, white, or otherwise. I got my own wife, my own set of problems. And, and exactly the way I feel. You can marry whomever you please as long as they're going to have you. You don't need my permission. You don't need me, right? Well, I can perform a ceremony for you. But the Bible clearly advises believers not to be unequally yoked with unbelievers. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 14 and 15. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believes with an infidel? And God commanding Hosea to marry an unfaithful woman, that's not permission for believers to run out and marry the first person, believer or not, who will have them. Okay? Now, I've seen a lot of Christians make this mistake. They're just so desperate to have a significant other in their life, they marry the first person that comes along, and one or two years down the road, they're ended up in a divorce court, and they can't figure out what happened. The reason the Bible says that believers should not marry unbelievers is that a believer married to an unbeliever will make your life even more difficult than it already is. You see, if you're going to live by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, this world is going to test you, and this world is going to try you. And being married to an unbeliever, that's going to make things exponentially more difficult in your life. Here's the Bible's position clearly stated. If you are married to an unbeliever, and this person is disposed to continue in marriage, then don't seek a divorce. If you become a believer... If you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ and then you find yourself married to someone who doesn't believe and has no inclination to believe and that person decides that they don't want any part of being married with you any longer and that they're leaving and that they're going to get a divorce, there's nothing you can do about it. You just have to live with that situation. And then if you are single, if you are a single person and you desire to be married, and you're a believer, the best course of action is to marry another believer. And if you truly want a God-honoring marriage, then allow for God to bring that right person into your life. Right? Don't go, go, don't go out there and try to do God's work for Him. You just pray, you lift up your petitions to God, and you ask Him to bring that right person into your life. And then you find this is where 1 Corinthians 7, 17 applies. But as God hath distributed to every man, as the Lord hath called everyone, so let him walk. In other words, continue forward by faith in Jesus Christ in the situation and circumstances that you are found in. And listen, trust God. If he's going to make you, he can change your circumstances. He can train, change your situation. He can make it better it, as he sees fit. Just let him do it. Don't try to do God's work for him. You just step back and let him do what he will. So, but it, 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 I, I'm lonely. It's, it, it's difficult. Of course it's difficult. But you just got to trust God and let him do what he will do. There's also another consideration concerning marriage and divorce that I'd like to address. Okay? And just as long as we're on the subject, it might be a little off subject from the, the message today, but I, I need to address this and I want to address this. There are people and they wonder, is it okay for me? I've been divorced. Is it okay for me to be remarried? That's the question they might ask. You see, there's some pastors out there, some preachers, and they won't perform a marriage between two divorced people. And the reason they won't is because of what it says in 1 Corinthians 7, 10 through 11. And unto the married I command, yet not I, but the Lord, let not the wife depart from her husband. But if, but, and if she depart, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband, and let not the husband put away his wife. And that's speaking to, you know, divorce and reconciliation. And there's a lot that we can address here about marriage and divorce. But you know what? That's a whole other subject for a whole different message. Today we're concerned with the subject of finding ourselves unequally yoked. But I still want to say this. I want to say this to anyone who happens to be divorced and now finds themselves single. And you might be wondering about, is it righteous, is it unrighteous, is it right or is it wrong if I go and if I'm married again? Now according to my understanding of Scripture, and of course this is based upon my opinion that is based upon Scripture. All right? 
So if you come to me later and you're like, well, what do you think? This is what I think. This is what I believe, okay? And there are other people who hold different opinions, okay? I do not think that a divorced person seeking to engage in a new marriage to someone other than the person they divorced, I don't think that's a sin and I don't think there's a problem. Okay? Here's why. Based upon two scriptures. The first is 1 Corinthians 7, 8, 9. I say, therefore, to the unmarried and to widows, it is good for them if they abide even as I. What was Paul? He was a bachelor for his entire life. But listen to what he says. If they cannot contain, in other words, if they're just, if they cannot help themselves, let them marry, for it's better to marry than to burn. Better to marry than to burn. And then the second verse of Scripture is found in 1 Timothy 5.11. But the younger widows refuse, for when they have begun to wax wanton against Christ, they will marry. And then he says this, I will therefore that younger women marry, bear children, guide the house, give none occasion to the adversary to speak reproachfully, for some are already turned aside after Satan. And so listen, listen. A, a divorced man or divorced woman coming to Christ, and they have a whole new life in Christ, and they want to have a strong and godly marriage. And they want to they want to have a family. They want the blessings they see in other people. And they're pursuing a marriage relationship with another believer so that they can raise a godly family. Look, strong and godly marriages encourage strong faith in family, strong faith in the church. And so if God brings someone into your life and He's brought you together and He's blessed that, what God has brought together, let no man tear apart. I said all this to say this. If you're divorced and you want to be married again and you're looking for a significant other, then you pray and let God bring that person in your life. And then you come to me and we'll have a great big wedding ceremony and we'll say God bless and amen. Now, if you disagree with what I've just said, that's fine. We can disagree. Right? You can hold whatever opinion you like. Right? But if you think that it's your place to interfere into other people's lives and to get in the middle of their marriages and their family and their relationships, their business, and you believe yourself to be the arbiter of all that should be deemed appropriate in the church, now look, you've just left your lane. Other people's lives are none of your business. Other people's lives are none of your business. But how difficult is it? How difficult is it for people to mind their own business, right? So difficult. But this brings us back to the situation that Hosea was in. So we have Hosea. He's a man of God. He's a preacher. All right? Imagine he's a pastor in our day and age. And he's married to an, a, an unfaithful woman. What is more, she's a woman who sold herself into prostitution. See, Hosea was a man of God. And he was on God's mission who ha and he happened to be unequally yoked. And, and here's the reason why we're in the book of Hosea this morning. Listen, your family will affect your ministry. Family affects ministry. That's why we're concentrating on marriage and the family. Here's the basics. We're all saved by faith in Jesus Christ. When we come to Christ, we're saved, we're sanctified, we're equipped by the Holy Spirit, and then we're called into the ministry. Every single believer, no matter what your past is, whether you're divorced and remarried, single, and whether you're single or married, whether you have a sinful past, or maybe you believe that you've had a pristine past, we know that ain't true, but some people actually act that way. Every believer has a calling. Every believer has a ministry. And family, our relationships will affect the ministry. Family affects your ministry in several different ways. First of all, it affects your ministry in the amount of time that you have to give to the ministry and to the Lord Jesus Christ. Family affects your ministry in the amount of resources you have to apply to the work of the ministry. Family affects your ministry in the direction your life will move, whether towards a greater fulfillment of ministry or toward family. Family will affect your ministry and how others view you operating in your calling in light of how they see your family. Now, it's this one that is probably the most difficult one that I've ever had to deal with. And you'll find many preachers and pastors and music directors and youth leaders who've had to deal with the very same thing. Other people being critical of them and their ministry based upon what? 
The fact that they don't like or care for their family. So what I'm saying is that how other people view and judge your family, it's going to affect your ability to minister. It's going to affect whether you have problems in the church, problems in the world, or not. It's not how it should be, but that's how it is. And the only way that you're ever going to get beyond being frustrated by that is to realize that that is the reality in the world today. There are, there are dishonest people in the world, there are unscrupulous people in the world, and they will use any means whatsoever to stop you from fulfilling your ministry and your calling. What has to be the most obvious way unequally yoked, being unequally yoked will affect your ministry is in this. A house divided cannot stand. A house divided cannot stand. When a believer is married to an unbeliever, this couple will have two minds about everything. I would go so, so far to say that in a marriage where one person is a believer and the other person is not, that the only time that there is any peace and real agreement is when that Christian in that family, in that relationship, allows the unbeliever to have his or her way just to keep the peace. Because that's what many Christians do with people who are, are overbearing in their lives. They simply let them have their ways because they just don't want to fight about it. They don't want to argue about it. Something like this. My wife and I, we're in agreement a lot. Uh, we agree all the time. But in reality, my wife is usually just letting me have my way because she doesn't want to fight about it. It can be the other way around when we agree. Uh, you know, we don't really agree on what we're talking about. We just decide to let one have their way so we don't fight about it. And that's, you see that in... in um, in couples who've been married for a long time. That's how they learn to relate to one another. And I'm being a little facetious, but it'd be something like, you know, the wife says, you know, I want to go out and buy some hats and gloves for the grandkids. It's winter, it's cold, they need new hats and gloves. And you probably got stacks of hats and gloves all over your house that she's bought for them in years past, right? And she comes to you and says, I think the grandkids or the kids need new hats and gloves. But instead of starting a fight and saying, you know what, what about all these gloves all around the house? You know what they say? You say, well, do whatever you want, honey. You're going to do whatever you want anyway. Right? You see what I'm saying? They didn't work fighting about it. I mean, you got to get the right picture. And I'm thinking of Granny and Poppy. Because Poppy was the best at this. When Granny, her grandparents, which were great people, by the way, loved visiting them. So Granny would come out and say, I'm going to do this for dinner. And Poppy would say, that's fine, honey. And she'd leave, and I'd be sitting there, and he'd go, and she's going to do whatever she wants to anyway. Well, okay. <laughs> I'm not saying that all couples are this way. I'm talking about couples who are unequally yoked. Right? Being unequally yoked will affect your agreement or disagreement on things. Being unequally yoked will also affect how others view you and how they view your family. And unscrupulous men and women can and will use your family against you. Unprincipled people will if they have a disagreement with you, if they think that you can get away with it, they won't come at you straightforward. They will attack you to the back door through your family. 1 Timothy 3, 1-5 says, This is a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desires a good work. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach, not given to wine, no striker, not greedy, a filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous. And then he ends with this. One that rules well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity, meaning with all respect. For if a man know not how to rule his own house well, how shall he take care of the church of God? Now that's Paul's guidelines for leadership in the church. This is what Paul says. This is the type of character that you ought to look for in a pastor, in a leader in the church, right? But listen. You are never going to find a man who is the perfect pastor according to the, the Bible because what Paul is presenting is a picture of perfection. And there is no man who's ever been perfect, nor will he ever be. There's no family who's ever been perfect, nor will there ever be. It is enough. It is enough if a man desires for this, uh, for, for his, this for his life. It is enough if a man desires this for his life and is it, and making strides to be a man of this type of character. 
And who knows whenever he makes a mistake to repent and to seek the forgiveness of the Lord and to continue forward with the Lord. So that's enough. But the last part of this verse, 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 5, calls upon a man of God to rule his own house well, doesn't it? It says, a man who rules his own house well, to keep his children in subjection, which means that they ought not to be unruly, and they should respect others, and they really should respect the church and respect God. But listen, you've got to know this. If you, everybody in this room is a parent, you know how this works. No matter how diligent you are to raise your children in the training and admonition of the Lord, no matter how diligent you are to bring them up in the Bible and to try, try to teach them the right way, those little suckers have a free will. <laughs> Amen. And they're going to do what they will do. And they're going to get in trouble. Sometimes they're going to be well behaved and you're going to be so proud and the next minute they can make you, you know, you can bite the heads off of nails. They've got you so angry. Amen. Right? Amen. And yet, in this ministry the Lord has called me to. There have been no shortage of people. In every church I've ever pastored, except for this one, there's been no shortage of people who have attempted to use this verse to disqualify me from the ministry. So you don't really fit the position of a pastor. I don't have to listen to you. And if that's your opinion of me, or the Word of God, or what we're doing here, this is not the church for you. Do you understand? If you can't respond to my leadership as the pastor in this church, then you need to go to church somewhere else. And if you come after my family, we're going to throw down. Because I've had enough of that nonsense. It's my family. I'll deal with it. And if you can't handle my family, go to church somewhere else. Well, you shouldn't tell people to go to church somewhere else. Why not? Do I? I'm not going to invite... I'm not going to invite trouble into my household. In the 22 years that I've been a pastor, there have been people who have tried to use my family against me more times than I, uh, than, than, than I care to recall. Not just when I've been a pastor either, but when I've been the member of the church my dad was pastor and they tried to turn me against my own father. I said, but do you realize who you're talking to? And who that man is? And the point being is this, family will affect your ministry. But the relationships that we have, they do not disqualify you from the ministry. They do not remove the calling that's on your life. Based upon the calling of Hosea's life, Hosea's life, listen, what we see in Hosea is that you can fulfill your calling in spite of your family limitations if you have any. Right? In short, listen, this is what I'm saying to you this morning. You don't have to have a perfect family in order to go out and serve the Lord and do what you're called to do. And any person who presents that you do, they're wrong. You just keep moving on with Jesus and let them be wrong. You don't have to have a perfect family in order to fulfill your calling. As a matter of fact, I'd go so far to say is none of us have a perfect family. I don't know where this idea comes from. You know, that, that the preacher's family ought to be perfect or, or the Sunday school director's family needs to be perfect or anybody who serves in the church has to have a perfect family. I don't know where the idea comes from. See, is I don't know anybody who has a perfect family. I mean, I can, I have endured complaints and I've had criticisms about my family from a church member who called me to go and visit their kid in jail. I want to have a word with you about your family. And when we're done, could, would you mind going to see Johnny? He's got himself locked up again. <laughs> Who are you to talk to me about my family? I'm not, that's true story. Amen. True story. I mean, I don't know about you, but that just seems a little hypocritical to complain about my family who's never broken the law and then have me go visit your family who's all locked up. But that really expresses that any kind of criticism like that is illegitimate. Illegitimate. And if, if there's somebody in your church, if there's somebody in, who's, who you know, and they love the Lord, and they want to serve Him, and they're struggling with family issues, you shouldn't criticize them. You ought to be praying for them. You ought to be praying for the salvation of those family members. You ought to be praying that their family and home life is something blessed. 
Can you imagine the kind of abuse that Hosea may have endured because of his wife? Think about it. Right? His wife ran away, sold herself into prostitution. But what did God tell Hosea to do? He said, I want you to marry this woman. And I want you to love this woman. Because she's a picture of uh, your relationship to her is a picture of my relationship to Israel. See, Hosea's marriage to Gomer, his unfaithful wife, that was all a part of the plan. And that was all a part of the calling. And that was all a part of Hosea's ministry. God used Hosea's relationship to his unfaithful wife as a picture of his own relationship to his unfaithful children. And then God used uh, Hosea's relationship to his wife and, and the children that they had and the family he had. He used his children as, to further illustrate and punctuate what was happening between God and Israel. So every part of Hosea's life, every part of Hosea's life, which included his family, that was all a part of God's plan for his life. And it was all a part of his calling on his life. It was all a part of his ministry. Now, how do you like that? But the beautiful thing, the beautiful thing, when you read about Hosea and his relationship to Gomer, his unfaithful wife, which, consequently, is an apt description of the manner in which God loves us. Listen, the beautiful thing about this is that no matter how wrong Gomer treated Hosea, he always went and loved her and brought her home. You see that? Chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. Then said the Lord unto me, Go yet love a woman beloved of her friend, yet an adulterer. According to the love of the Lord. Love her according to the love of the Lord. You see the picture? She's an adulterer. She keeps wandering away. She keeps doing sinful things. But I want you to go and bring her home and love her with the very same love that I love you. Love her with the love of the Lord toward the children of Israel who look to other gods and love flagons of wine. They're idolaters and they're drunkards and they're drug addicts. So I bought her to me for 15 pieces of silver, for a homer of barley and a half homer of barley. And I said to her, Thou shalt abide for me many days. Thou shalt not play the harlot. Thou shalt not be for another man. So will I also be with thee. So she sold herself into prostitution. Could you? I, 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 cannot, I cannot fathom. I, have, I don't have any, any inkling of what Hosea's going through. That's got to be one rough marriage relationship that he's in. She ran off and then sold herself into prostitution. I, I imagine it's something like uh, being married to a drug addict who's always selling off everything in the house just to get drugs. I couldn't imagine the pain of having to endure that. She runs off. She sells herself into prostitution. And Hosea has to go out. He has to first find her. Here's a man of God. Can you imagine him going into brothels looking for his wife? Imagine in the synagogue. Oh, I saw that Hosea. He went into a he went into a courthouse. <laughs> what can you imagine? He was doing there. <laughs> Amen. Shame on you. You don't know what's happening. When he found her, what did he have to do? He had to go and buy her way out of prostitution. It cost him, didn't it? it cost him something. He had to pay to bring her home. Why? Why would he do this? Why did he do this? Most of us in this day and age, if someone was like that in our life, what would we do? We'd write them off. Psh, they made their choices. I don't have to live with that. Well, Jose, Jose, he went and got his wife, brought her home, paid to do so because he loved her. That's love. Even though she was unfaithful, even though she was untrue, even though she had no character, he loved her. The Lord told Hosea to love his wife in the same way that he loves Israel. The Lord told Hosea to love his wife in the very same way that he loves you and me. Because it cost him everything to save us. Right? Even though we were unfaithful and untrue, it cost him everything to save us. We seem to act like we've done God a favor by coming to faith in Christ, don't we, sometimes? I haven't done God any favors. It cost him everything to redeem our souls. He ransomed us from bondage, the bondage of sin. 
So I, I looked to the Lord Jesus and I said to myself, if the Lord Jesus can love me enough to forgive my faults, my sins, my adultery, and to rescue me from the bondage of sin, well, I guess then it's not too much for me to go out and love the loved ones. Right? Even if I find that attitude in my own family, especially if I find that attitude in my own family, See, everything the Lord does on our behalf is on our behalf. Everything that the Lord brings into our life is according to His purpose, including the relationships that we have. And it will ultimately result in our being blessed. Right? How do I know this? Because the Bible says that all things work together for good to those who love Jesus and are called according to His purpose. And you see this again and again and again in the Bible. So can you love an unfaithful person? Can you love an unfaithful person? Can you love an uncommitted person? Can you love an awful person? Yes. Because we've all been unfaithful to Jesus at one time or another. We've all been uncommitted. We've all been awful. And you know what he does? He forgives us. He forgives us. And you know what he does? He loves us. And then he redeems us. Brings us back. Every time we wander away, he goes out, he finds us, he brings us back. Now his love is what resides in our hearts, which allows us to love others. And what is more, I'm going to close with this. Not only can you love the unloving, but you can continue to serve the Lord and fulfill your calling. Even if you don't have the perfect family. You can do what God asks you to do, and you don't have to have the perfect family to do it. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the life of Hosea. And an an example that he just presents to us. And I pray that we'll take this and that we will just dwell on it. Lord, I, I pray that you would teach us to be more loving, more kind, and also to go out and boldly proclaim your love and your truth so that others can be redeemed. I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Amen.